Hey guys, JJ back here. This time to chat on a game out of the MAC, the M-A-A-C. Uh, Ryder, minus two versus Sienna, total 136. Uh, before I go into that game, we uh, we were able to grab another win on the channel. Uh, this time with Bradley, bringing the, the channel's plays uh, up to 15-4 and four against the spread. Now, Missouri State came out a bit hot from outside in that game, but uh, certainly cooled off in the second half, uh, allowing the more confident team in Bradley to close out down the stretch. I know at the half, you could have bet Bradley at about plus 150 money line, maybe a little more than that, maybe a little less, depending on your book, um, or got them at about plus four and a half or plus five at the half um, in that specific spot. Uh, and while these were good numbers in hindsight, I have to be clear about something with live betting. Um, let's say if you have to be a constant nine out of 10, you know, from a disciplinary perspective in making pregame bets, you, you literally have to be like a like a 13 out of 10 making live bets uh, from that same disciplinary perspective. Um, and, and ultimately, because you can get yourself into severe trouble chasing if you start if you start live betting. Um, in a sport like basketball, where it's common for teams to go on a 7-8, you know, 7-0 seven, run, 8-0 run, 10-0 run throughout the game, this is going to completely flip the live odds all over the place throughout the game. Here's my two cents, though. We liked Bradley pregame. So when you compare it to the opening line um, and you, you see that they're down seven at the half and, and you can and you can live bet them at one and a half to one on the money line, uh, it is intriguing. But as I told you, I, for me to double down in a game, 70% uh, is the number I'm looking for uh, to throw that second unit on pregame. If you're going to decide to do this live betting, uh, that number even has to be higher because, again, you're going to have multiple spots like that where – you see you bet a team, and then at the half, the team you bet laying five is down five. So now it's like now you can live bet them um, you know, at minus 110 money line, and you're, you're thinking, oh, that's so favorable. But, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, when you bet the game pregame, the idea wasn't that they would be down seven at the half, right? So the fact that that happens, uh, the line they're giving you is, is, is as if the line began, as if the game began, you know, 7-0 Missouri State. So what I like to tell people is, would you make that bet like the bet you're looking at live instead of instead of comparing it direct to the to the, to the line you're betting like instead of like oh so it's it, it, now I could see Bradley at plus five and a half or plus five or whatever um, instead of saying oh well at pregame they were only you know pregame only plus two now I can get five so you know it seems favorable now the money line is even better so it seems favorable but you know what I need you guys to do is ask yourself pregame, would you bet the same team, in this case Bradley, if the game started out 7-0? So would you bet them plus five if the game started out 7-0? Because I know that it seems so obvious, right? Like, oh, okay, uh, you know, yeah, well, obviously that's the bet I'm making. They're down 7-0 at the half. But it, it's not truly the case because people always compare it to the opening line. And while there is some value there to be had at times, you need to realize that do you want to bet a team that's struggling? Because keep in mind, when you're in that spot, okay, if, if half begins and the team doesn't have the ball and the other team goes on a quick 4 or run, boom, Bradley's down 11. I mean, in this case, Bradley's down 11. And then you start then you start thinking about calling off calling off the dogs because then a team like Bradley might just start heaving up threes to catch up. Then then 11 becomes 14. Then 14 becomes 18. Then they get a, then they make a few frustrated fouls. Then maybe a technical foul gets called. And that, game, that, that, that becomes a loser quicker than ever. What I'm getting at is Bradley played well in the second half, and, and obviously everything medianed out where Bradley ended up winning, and it was it was a spot where it would have worked out for you if you did it. But it's not something I promote. I don't promote the live betting aspect because ultimately, what are you doing? You're live chasing. That's what you're doing. I mean, you're doubling down as a live chase for the idea that, hey, I'm getting a better number now, so even if I lose the main bet, I can still get some back here. I'm really not for it. There's really isolated spots where it makes sense, where it legitimately makes sense. So, you know, to answer your questions or any questions anybody has with regards to doubling down live betting, if your team originally is is in a hole a bit, um, you know, I, I rarely do it. Rarely do it. Um, when I do live bet, though, I do it typically only to hedge a little backwards. Let me give you an example. Let's take the OU-Kansas game from a few nights back. OU comes out blazing hot, leads by more than 17, you know, and I gave you guys OU um, – 
with getting getting points against Kansas at home, I think. Getting one or two points. Either way, I gave you OU. Loved, loved the play. Uh, and they come out blazing hot. They lead by uh, one point in the first half by more than 17 points. Uh, now, when they went up 17, I went and bet KU uh, plus 600 for a sixth of a unit. So, I mean, uh, uh, plus 650. It might have been when they were up 19. I, I just remember I got plus 650. So here's what happens. If OU wins as they should in that spot, I still clear five-sixths of a unit because obviously I gave a little bit back on that one-sixth of a unit live bet on Kansas plus 650, but I still clear five-sixths of a unit if what's supposed to happen in that scenario happens, right? If somehow, though, OU blows the lead, I still get my money back with the Kansas money line bet with a little bit of extra, with a little bit of extra. So I profit regardless. But notice, I only profit slightly if OU loses. When you hedge like this, you need to make sure that your, your math is correct. You don't want to put yourself in a scenario where you're actually now rooting for your hedge, right? So for me, I do it a little bit so that I can get my money back from the original bet plus a little bit more. Because you're using the math, you're using the 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 inverse math that's occurred throughout the game because of a, you know a ceiling type of game from Oklahoma, but you're using the math to your advantage, right? So again, if OU is to uh, run them out of the gym, I still clear five sixths of a unit. It's a small it's a small sliver that I lose. But if Kansas comes back and wins, I still profit. I still profit a little bit, and it's worth it. Um, if you're hedging more to make to if you're hedging. Uh, in scenarios where you're now rooting for your hedge, you're completely fucking up because you're implying all along that the team you wanted to win was not the team you originally bet. Uh, this hedging technique that I just mentioned to you serves two purposes. Number one, your initial bet is protected regardless of the outcome. Now, of course, you're still going to root for your original ma- bet you made, in this case, um, Oklahoma, but um, you will still profit a little bit if somehow Kansas was to come back and win and you're not trimming much off your Oklahoma loss anyway. Number two, you will avoid a tilting situation. You see, most people don't see tilt coming until it's too late. Uh, When you have a bet like Oklahoma in that spot, who jumps out to a huge lead, you're practically already counting that money in your head that you've won from the bet. You've already assumed that money is in your account, where you're going to spend it next. You're looking at games to bet the next day. So what happens when Kansas comes back and wins and you no longer have that money? You're fucking pissed off, right? You know, the world's against you. How does this happen? I'm the most unluckiest person. I had the game had the game picked properly. How does Oklahoma lose that game? Uh, such a bad beat. These are all things people say. But you can avoid that scenario entirely by putting that small, you know, hedge on a, on a big money line bet on the other side so that when that catastrophe happens, it's not nearly as tilting. You've still profited. Now, granted, you might still be pissed off. Hey, look, I lost, you know, I lost the opportunity to win more money. But you didn't lose money. You won money. You won a little bit of money on how that ended up going, on how that game ended, how that game ended, despite really, you know, going unfavorably from the time Oklahoma had the huge lead. Um, what this really does is avoid you going into deep tilt. Because again, as long as you can mentally compartmentalize the fact that you've won that game. By doing that hedge, you've profited from that game, and you just move on. Um, it'll definitely, definitely keep you um, uh, get you much, much better sleep that night. Anyway, um, and I definitely think it's something you guys should 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 look into. Again, you only lose a small piece of the pie if uh, if if OU loses in that spot, and if OU wins, you only you only take a small cut. Uh, so definitely worth it, and, and definitely avoids tilt. And uh, I can go over a, a more detailed video on, on proper hedging strategies. When is the actual ideal time in a game to live bet hedge? But uh, all in all, uh, I hope this little tidbit was informative for you. Uh, so let's dive right into the game. As mentioned, Ryder minus two versus Siena totals 136. This line opened at one, um, has since been moved to two. This was one of the main reasons why I delayed doing this video. Um, I did feel like this was going to be like the Bradley situation where, you know, public money was going to come in on the other side and uh, move move the line in a favor that I wanted it to move in. So that's why I do this video a little late. Um, this game is at 9.30 tonight, though. You have plenty of time to watch this video and get that bet in. Um, my second favorite mid-major conference to bet on is the MAC. Um, I like this conference. Uh, another non-sexy conference, but this is another another one of those conferences where a lot of people, a lot of lines have holes in them, and a lot of people who don't watch this conference end up betting on this conference. So I can tell you this, you know, the the MVC and the MAC are two conferences I love to bet on. I love to get the games. I get the games on ESPN3. Um, and, you know, I pay that shitty fucking subscription that they make me pay for uh, to get these games. And I like to watch certain teams in these conferences because th- this conference in particular has a lot of teams that play fast. 
and a lot of teams that play slow. They're basically split down the middle. There are very few mid, mid-range mid tempo teams. When some of these teams meet up against one another, it creates, you know, matchup havoc. And uh, this is a perfect scenario. This is a perfect storm scenario um, uh, for this. Now, again, people will look at this game and, and jump on the Ryder bandwagon uh, thinking, you know, well, actually, I mean, Ryder is a better team than CNI. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. Um, however, Ryder does not match up very well in this situation. Now, Ryder scores a ton of points, plays at one of the fastest paces in the country, and, uh, you know, if you're betting this game, you're probably thinking, you know, who the fuck is Siena? Well, for starters, uh, this game is being played in the Times Union Center. Uh, it is a home game for Siena. This is where Siena plays its home games. Not sure if everybody knows that, but uh, this this is why this line isn't isn't bigger than maybe most would assume. Maybe they think they're getting a bunny here. But this game is being played uh, as a home game for Siena. Um, so from the rider side, uh, as mentioned, rider, you know, offers up one of the fastest tempos, tempos in D1. It's their ninth um, in quickest tempo. So they're getting the ball out quick. Uh, when they when they start their offense, um, they are winners of four or five teams playing fairly well. Worth noting, though, they have been favored in all five of those games, only going three and two against the spread. Before this little three and two stretch, they were actually zero and nine against the spread, uh, which included a home loss to our friends over at Siena uh, as a seven and a half point favorite. Um, whenever two teams play one another, you can't just look at records, you can't just look at box scores. You can't just look at strength of schedule or even recent play. You need to look at from a from a statistical standpoint how do those two teams how do these two teams match up, right? So what Ryder does really well is they force turnovers, and those those turnovers lead to extra easy layups, easy baskets. That's why they're one of the best um, uh, two point shooting uh, teams in the country. A lot of their baskets are layups and dunks off of off of uh, you know don't get me wrong they play good offense so they move the ball around well and they get good shots but. A lot of their, they get a, get a good amount of their points off of, at least higher than average amount of their points off of turnovers uh, with easy easy transitions baskets. Now, how does, how does Siena neutralize this? Well, Siena is uh, one of the least turnover teams in Division I basketball. Not even just in this conference. In Division I basketball, this team does not turn the ball over. Now, these two teams played, a few, like I said, a few weeks back, and Siena only had 11 turnovers. That frustrated the hell out of Ryder. Siena, that was one of the main reasons why Siena was able to pull the upset. I don't look too much into that game, but... Um, what I will say is that, you know, the numbers held true in that game. Siena did not turn the ball over. Really frustrated Ryder. Uh, Ryder shot one of 20 from three. And uh, Siena is the best three-point shooting team defensively in this conference. So I get it. They're not going to shoot that poorly. But it doesn't surprise me that Ryder struggled from from threes because uh, Siena is very good at defending against it. Um, Ryder is excellent at getting to the free throw line. They're top 25 in the country, actually. But Siena can counter that by not fouling. They are the 35th least foul-prone team in the country. Uh, they do not. They do not foul. They just play good defense. Uh, worth noting that Ryder is ranked 348th in Division One basketball in free throw percentage. So most certainly, we don't expect this team to pull away at the free throw line. Uh, not to say that a, a one game anomaly can't happen, but this team, this team shoots 61% as a team from the free throw line. So you're definitely going to see quite a few free throw misses here. Um, okay, let's look at the Siena side now. Siena is winners of three or one straight up in the last four. Uh, and they are three and one against the spread in those same games. They are ten and four record since January seventeenth, with one of those um, being an, a rider upset on the road. I want to be clear about something. That upset was no fluke. Siena is the number one defense in conference in this conference uh, in conference play, um, and defends a three ball better than any team in this conference. What we have here is a team in Siena playing in their home gym against a team they match up really well against, getting two points. This just screams out value to me. Uh, Siena will slow this game to a crawl. They play at an exact opposite pace that Ryder does, and this should really frustrate Ryder by not giving away those free transition baskets with the fact that Siena does not turn the ball over. Um, in a one-game sample, look, anything can happen here. Siena could come out uh, nervous, whatever, turn the ball over a ton. Ryder could actually make their free throws. Uh, Ryder could could um, could shoot very efficiently. Siena could go down 10 and all of a sudden go out of their out of their comfort zone and start speeding the game up and then Ryder could turn this game into a blowout, but I want to be clear that we are always looking for value, okay? There's nobody that can predict the future. There's no one that can predict anything. I have this game capped at Siena at pick or Siena minus a half a point, so the fact that I'm getting to with Siena is a nice swing in our favor. Uh, ultimately, I have, the, I have the, this is the wrong team favorite in this spot. Ryder is a much better team. I want to be more clear on that as well, but they just do not match up well against Siena. So ultimately, love this spot for Sienna. Plus two versus Ryder. Game's at 9.30 Eastern tonight. I want to thank you guys for watching the video. Um, thanks for all the new subscribers that have, that have come on and, and, and started watching the videos. Hope you find these videos informative. I know I like to begin these with, uh, with a little bit, a few tidbits in, in, in different directions uh, just to help you all become better sports bettors. Uh, again, if you like the video, give it a thumbs 
up. And feel free to comment on the on the video. Uh, I know this is not the sexiest of picks, but uh, again, I'm not I'm not looking for sexy. I'm looking for value. Uh, so want to uh, wish us all the best of luck on this game. Uh, and uh, thanks again for watching. Back soon.